We're in the middle of a lengthy and uh, challenging discussion on the topic on Paul and the law. And in the first session, we were introduced to the problem, and that is the differing and seemingly contradictory nature of the statements that Paul makes. And then in the second session, we looked at proposed solutions. We skimmed over most of them, but we did slow down and spend a bit of time on the reform view. Remember, the reform view begins with, uh, or it could be called a harmonizational approach, because you try to take all of Paul's statements and you try to harmonize them together. You try to discern what is the coherent view of the law that Paul has. And uh, we made, uh, in that reform presentation, we saw that the reform faith has classically distinguished between three different types of law, three different types of law. Now we move on to um, another, so to say, uh, way of making distinctions. Um, it can be called distinguishing getting in from staying in, and that is a vocabulary made famous by the work of E.P. Sanders, otherwise known as Ed Sanders, and, and, and it clearly had a paradigm-changing effect on the discussion, and thereby we need to look carefully at the work of E.P. Sanders in order to understand the new perspective on Paul, which we'll deal with yet in a subsequent presentation. Now, there aren't many books that have had a paradigm-shifting effect within the academic world, but this book by E.P. Sanders did. It was published in 1977, and the book is a bit mistitled. Instead of being entitled Paul and Palestinian Judaism, it more accurately should have been titled Palestinian Judaism and Paul. Why? Because about two-thirds of the book dealt with Judaism and only a third with Paul. And it was the Judaism part, not the Paul part, it was the Judaism part where Sanders' work had the greatest impact and that's where we are going to focus our attention on too. Now why did Sanders' book have such a great influence? Well, a couple of reasons. One, he dealt with the Jewish sources in a first-hand way than no other New Testament scholar really had before. Um, by that I mean he dealt with the rabbinical writings, the writings connected with the Talmud, and that involves, um, it wasn't really translated in English until recently, that involves uh, working with Hebrew. The Hebrew of the Talmud is different than Biblical Hebrew, and the texts of the Talmud are frankly not that exciting. It's kind of tedious. And so there were no real New Testament scholars who had wrestled with firsthand these texts before. And so that's the first thing that uh, Sanders did differently. Secondly, um, he, uh, despite advocating a thesis that he said uh, was not new, all right, so let me just explain that too. In other words, he freely admitted that the claim he was making was not something originating with him, but had been made by other scholars beforehand, but had been ignored. Why? Because only a few scholars had made this claim before. They were typically Jewish New Testament scholars. And you can understand that there weren't many Jews, that is, Jews who are not Christians, who decided to devote all their time and energy and their career for the New Testament. But there were a few, and a few of those voices had asserted the same thing that he had, but, um, but, but, but they were ignored. And they were ignored not only because they were small, in terms of their number, but they were ignored now for a second reason why Sanders' book became so effective, and that is it came out in 1977, in other words, after the Second World War. His book and his thesis about Judaism uh, was given to an audience that was much more receptive and eager to hear a message in which Judaism, instead of being criticized or faulted, was kind of highlighted. In other words, there was a hypersensitivity against anything that smacked of anti-Semitism. And so when Sanders came along and argued that Judaism was not this negative, works, righteous, legalistic religion that it had been typically portrayed to be, when Sanders came along and argued that Judaism was just as much a religion of grace as Christianity was, well, that was received uh, well within not only academic circles, but other places too. And so those are at least two reasons why Sanders' book had uh, a great impact in the academy. And you can see that I'm not exaggerating. The quote here from Carson and Moose says, quote, 
Sanders' basic proposal found ready acceptance and has in many quarters over the course of the past 25 years attained the status of an assumed result of scholarship. And that's exactly the case. So it has ready acceptance and the vast majority of New Testament scholars just assume that Sanders is right. So they don't question his conclusions at all. Now there are two parts to uh, Sanders' argument, and that is he first challenged the traditional view of uh, Judaism. Now that traditional view of Judaism is sometimes called a reformational view. Be careful now, not a reform view, reformational. So any any theologian, uh, you know, the church after the Reformation, sometimes it's called more narrowly the Lutheran Orthodox view of Judaism. But this was a wide view of Judaism, one that you probably grew up with and heard from the pulpit or from Sunday school material, and that is that Judaism was, as we've already said, a legalistic, works righteous religion, right? Devoid of grace, in contrast, supposedly, to the New Testament. And so, when Sanders challenged that view of Judaism, that naturally, that logically challenged also the church's view of Paul. Why? Because Paul was typically portrayed as being involved in a battle against legalism or works righteousness. But wait a minute, Sanders is arguing that Judaism was not that way. And not only was Sanders claiming that Judaism was not legalistic works righteous, therefore the implication was the earliest Christians couldn't have been legalistic or works righteous either, and thereby that wasn't the problem that Paul was arguing about when he talked about the law. That's how it relates to our discussion. So when Paul talks about the works of the law, for example, the old view was, oh, he was addressing a legalistic works righteous perspective, and now that traditional understanding, not only of Paul, but of the Judaism of his day, has been uh, removed, supposedly, by the uh, assertion of Sanders. Now, um, I'm going to skip over some of these uh, slides, and I, I guess this just basically says that the attraction of Sanders was that he appealed not only to supposedly the primary sources, the, the Mishnah, the Talmud, the writings of the rabbis, but also of some of the other writings of intertestamentary Judaism. Now, Sanders raises a question, uh, one that we should also uh, talk about, and that is, why did the Reformers... Why did the church, and especially after the Reformation, why did they get Paul and Judaism wrong? And Sanders argued that um, there was kind of like a, a hermeneutical circle. He argued that Luther and Calvin and Swingley, they looked at the problem of their day, right? What was the trouble in the world in the day of the reformers? And a big problem, uh, so the argument goes, and there's some truth to this, of course, is that um, the Catholic Church in that day was selling indulgences. It was promoting a kind of legalistic, works, righteous perspective that if uh, Christians would just do certain things, that would earn favor and credit with God. And so Sanders says that the reformers, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, and all these other people, they took the problem of their day and they read it back into the problem of Paul's day. In other words, the reformers were guilty of eisegesis. They were reading into the New Testament a problem that, from Sanders' point of view, wasn't there because the problem of legalism, works righteousness, simply wasn't a problem of Judaism, according to his uh, argument. And what's more, this false idea that kind of gained steam, especially during the Reformation days, Right? It became solidified in the subsequent uh, centuries by especially uh, the theologians of those ages. And who were the leading theologians of the 17, 18, and 1900s? They were primarily Germans. And so he argued again with some plausibility that there was an anti-Semitism. Right? There was a, a negative view of Judaism and of Jews which allowed this stereotype of Judaism, works righteous religion, negative religion, certainly inferior to Christianity to gain traction and indeed become entrenched within academic circles, and not just academic circles, but the church too.
Now Sanders comes along and uh, he argues for a different way of viewing Judaism. So uh, a big buzz phrase or uh, formula or expression that you should know from Sanders is the expression covenantal nomism. Covenantal nomism. So Sanders says that when you read Jews talking about the law, you have to realize that they're talking about the law from the perspective of the covenant. Right? from a covenantal point of view, and what's more, from the idea that they're already members of the covenant. So in other words, when Jews talk about the law, this is an in-house discussion, and the Jews are talking about the law not as a way to get into the covenant, but as a way to stay in the covenant. And so that also explains those other phrases from uh, Sanders, getting in versus staying in. You have some quotes here from uh, his, uh, his book which say exactly that, right? So just three quotes I picked at random from different parts of the book, but they all illustrate this claim. He says, covenantal nomism, right, is the view that one's place in God's plan is established on the basis of the covenant and that the covenant requires as the proper response, not the, not the entrance, Right, into the covenant, but the response of man, namely man's obedience to its commandments while providing means of atonement for transgressions. Page 75. Or later in the book, obedience maintains one's position in the covenant, but it does not earn God's grace as such. Right? So you obey the law not to get in, but to stay in. And in fact, you obey the law as a way of saying thank you to God. Excuse me. <coughs> And a third quote, righteousness in Judaism is a term which implies the maintenance of status among the group of the elect. And so here are three statements which assert his view of covenantal nomism and also the idea of getting in versus staying in. Uh, Tom Schreiner uh, has a very succinct explanation of the term covenantal nomism. He says, the subsuming of law under covenant explains why Sanders selects the term covenantal nomism. Remember, nomism is the Greek word for law, and so when Jews talk about the law, they do so from the perspective of already being members of God's covenant people. Here's a quote from Carson and Moo, which is also, uh, I think, in print a uh, 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 text that encapsulates the key idea of Sanders. Sanders concludes that these Jewish sources almost unanimously portray a view of soteriology, right, how one is saved, that he dubs covenantal nomism. Foundational to the Jewish view of salvation is the covenant that God entered into the people Israel. God has chosen Israel and Jews in Paul's day believe that the original gracious choice Right, was the basis for their election. Viewed from this perspective, Jews did not have to do the law to be saved. They were already saved. They obeyed the law rather to maintain their covenantal status. As Sanders put it, Jews do not do the law to, quote, get in, which would be legalism, but to, quote, stay in, which is nomism. Now, it's important for you not only to understand the argument that Sanders is making, but also to understand its implications for the New Testament. First of all, it has some powerful implications for understanding certain of Jesus' statements in the Gospels. Because in the Gospels we find criticism of certain Jews, especially the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. And these criticisms seem to attack these Jewish people for their legalistic, their works righteous perspective. Now, if Sanders is right, then these statements can't be historically accurate. Because remember, Sanders argues that no one, right, within Judaism was guilty of legalism. No one was guilty of this works righteous perspective. And thereby it would be impossible for Jesus to accuse somebody of being this very uh, thing, of being guilty of this, this theological error. In other words, it would, for, for Jesus to uh, attack people for being legalistic is as historically impossible as it would be for Jesus to say this, right? And behold, Jesus said to his disciples, look in the sky at the airplane passing by. 
And we would read a text like that and we would say, hey, that's historically impossible. Airplanes didn't exist in that day. Well, Sanders would say it's exactly the same thing with Jesus or other criticisms of legalism or works righteousness within Judaism, right? No one operated. No one was guilty of that sin. And thereby, these texts are not historically accurate. These texts did, were not said by Jesus, but rather they were creations of the early church. So the early church put these words into the mouth of Jesus. Why? Because the early church had a battle with Judaism. The early church wanted to portray Judaism as a negative, bad thing, and thereby they invented these critiques of Judaism and put this invented critique into the mouth of Jesus. Now, you may be shocked by that, and you should rightfully be so, but this is a common view of many scholars about the lack of historical ac accuracy, right? The, the lack of historicity about a number of Jesus' sayings in the Gospels. Now, Sanders then has a consequence not just for uh, the sayings of Jesus in the Gospels, but they also have a consequence for understanding Paul and the law. Paul has many references to the law, and especially he's got eight references to the works of the law, or just simply two works. And remember, the, the traditional way of understanding these texts, right? The, the church has for many, many years understood these, these, these references to the works of the law, or works in general, as Paul criticizing Christians for having a works righteous perspective, right? Trying to obey the law, right, trying to have certain works or deeds in their lives that would secure God's favor, that would earn their salvation. Now, if Sanders is right, then that interpretation of Paul is wrong. You see, Sanders says that not only did Jews not have this theological disease that we call legalism works righteousness, but then obviously Jewish Christians wouldn't have had that disease either, right? It wasn't a problem in the first century. And so therefore Paul couldn't have been arguing against that particular view. And, uh, and then, uh, of course, if but Paul is arguing against something, and so then the question is, what is he arguing about? And that then leads to the so-called new perspective on Paul. So what we need to see then is how Sanders' view is really the foundation for the traditional view on Paul and the law. And so if Sanders is right, then we take away that foundation and then the traditional view on Paul and the law collapses, right? It's no longer possible to argue that Paul in his letter to the Galatians or Paul in his letter to the Romans is criticizing against this works righteousness perspective. So that's where the big impact of Sanders' view of Judaism has for our discussion on Paul and the law. Now, most scholars don't agree with, with Sanders' view on Paul, right? But they do agree, remember the quote we said earlier, it's an accepted fact within the academy that Sanders is right about Judaism, and thereby that leads to these new or alternative views on Paul and the law. But I want us to uh, look more carefully at Sanders' position and say, is he right, or maybe is he right 100%? Is he completely right? Do we have to today, do we have to take away this view of Judaism which undergirds the traditional view on Paul and the law? And uh, let's see what the evidence uh, suggests. First of all, uh, we ought to say something positive, right? Our moms tell us, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. And in this case, I willingly and happily say something good about Sanders. In other words, he rightfully chastises the New Testament Academy and also the church, which follows in line with this old view that Judaism is only a works righteous religion, right? It's a stereotype of Judaism that all Jews were guilty of this legalistic way of thinking, and I think that that is a false view and it needs to be corrected. Carson and Moo, for instance, acknowledge the same thing we read in their uh, introductory textbook. Sanders' interpretation did bring some necessary corrective to a skewed view of Judaism in traditional scholarship. Jews in Paul's day were certainly less legalistic than many traditional portrayals have suggested. And so that's an important message for you and me to hear, especially since I know that too often Christians equate Judaism with the Old Testament. 
In other words, there are many Christians who think that the Old Testament is legalistic and works righteous, and thereby it's contrasted and negated by the New Testament, which is a testament of grace. But if you read the Old Testament carefully, right, we, we see God saying, it wasn't Israel because you were the biggest nation, right, or the most powerful nation. No, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, is just as much a covenant of grace as the New Testament, or the New Covenant is. And so we have to be careful that uh, this stereotype of Judaism doesn't not only cloud our view of Judaism, but also maybe distorts our view of the Old Testament. And so be careful of that, and we can be thankful to Sanders for positively correcting right this skewed view of Judaism. Nevertheless, all right, and so here comes some negative evaluations, and I need a number of them, because remember how widespread Sanders' view is, and so I need a number of these in a cumulative way to kind of make the case that well, Sanders, I'm going to say, is right, but only partly right, not 100% of the way right. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's start looking at some of the possible uh, critiques of Sanders' view. The first has to do with his sources. Now, remember, uh, the strength of his position was he used the Jewish sources themselves, and that was something that no one had done before, and that's a helpful and important thing he did. But the date of those sources, those rabbinical sources, are quite late. They date to the 3rd, 4th, and even 5th century A.D. And we have to be careful, then, that we don't put all our uh, conclusions on the basis of these rather late sources, 3rd, 4th, and even 5th century A.D., and we just cast aside, we diminish the testimony of the New Testament, which dates to the 1st century. And after all, we're interested in the Judaism of the 1st century, not the Judaisms of the 3rd, 4th, or 5th century. And so I just wonder whether he has too quickly right, uh, thrown away the New Testament with its witness about Judaism in the 1st century, and he's too quickly and too eagerly and too naively embraced those later sources. Secondly, uh, he seems to assume that the rabbis, right, the people who codified those texts in the 3rd, 4th, and 5th century AD, that the, that the rabbis are exactly identical with the Pharisees of the 1st century. And most scholars, even Jewish scholars, argue against that kind of one-for-one -one connection, especially since a very important event separates those two groups of people, namely the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. It's easy for you and me to diminish how significant an event that was simply because the temple never means that much to us, right? But it was a huge event in the psyche and we could also anticipate in the theology of Judaism when the place where God dwells, right? His Shekinah, His glory dwelt, that that place, that symbol of God's presence was destroyed. And so we ought not to assume too quickly that the rabbis of the 3rd, 4th, and 5th century, which Sanders uses again to uh, determine his view of Judaism, are identical with the Pharisees of the 1st century. Here's a quote uh, that supports that. Klaus Hocker says, Serious doubts have been raised whether we can speak of a reliable continuity between 1st century Pharisees and the rabbis of the 2nd, 3rd, or 4th century especially the tragedies of two unsuccessful rebellions. There was only one, right, that's 66 to 70, but there was another one, the Bar Kokhba revolt, right, in 132 to 135. So especially the tragedies of these two unsuccessful rebellions against the Romans had produced a deep reorientation in the development of Jewish thought. A third uh, important fact to consider is, instead of thinking of Judaism, singular, but think of Judaism's plural. Yes, there were a lot of ideas that held most Jews together, but by no means were all Jews agreed. We have evidence of that even from the New Testament itself, right? We read not just about the Pharisees, but we also read about the Sadducees and the Zealots and the Essenes and the Herodians. And, and these are only ones that are mentioned in the sources that have come down to us. There may well have been other groups or movements that um, haven't been recorded. And so 
the rabbinical writings, they only reflect the ideas, the beliefs, the convictions of one group within Judaism, namely the group that is traced back to the Pharisees, and we just saw a minute ago that it may not trace it back perfectly or without, uh, without any difference. There were other views within Judaism too, and so we ought to allow for the fact that maybe the Pharisees, or more accurately the rabbinical writings of the 3rd, 4th, and 5th century, reflect only the tradition of the Pharisees, and maybe there were legalistic tendencies in other movements within Judaism. Or here's another possibility, maybe the later rabbis only described Judaism as it ideally was, not as it actually was. Let's imagine that you had a chance to write down the Christian faith, right, in some kind of abstract way. I imagine you would portray Christianity in all of its glory, and you would hide maybe completely all of its warts, its faults. In other words, you would just talk about grace and uh, what happens when Christians become followers of Jesus and the sense of joy and hope they have not only for this life but the life to come, right? And you might downplay, you might not talk at all about how Christians struggle with sin and indeed how they fail and so forth. And so we ought to reckon with the possibility that the sources, excuse me, the sources that Sanders used may be um, only describe Judaism in its ideal form, not as it actually was. And if you had a chance to find out how it actually operated in the hearts and lives of first century Jews, you'd see that there was some danger, some presence of legalism or works righteousness way of thinking. Here's a, another quote from Hawker. There are now a few scholars who prefer to speak of Judaisms in the plural in order to avoid notions of too much homogeneity or normativeness. A fourth criticism is an important one, I think, and that is the distinction between getting in and staying in may not be as clean or as sharp as Sanders suggests. Let's imagine that, um, uh, I'll, say I'll do it this way, let's imagine that there are, um, let's say, five people sitting around uh, my table at home and I tell them that uh, they're part of the Wyma family. And I say to them that they didn't deserve to be a Wyman. It was a free and undeserved gift. They did nothing to deserve it, but they have this wonderful privilege of being a member of the Wyma family. And I stress not only the fact that they, they got in by grace into the Wyma family, but I also stress that, wait a minute, if you're a Wyma, you have to live the Wyma way. In other words, there are certain distinctive activities that we Wymas do, and I really emphasize them. I really highlight for them because I want you to say now, you're a Wyma, don't ever forget, and Wymas do this, and Wymas do that. And if I keep talking that way to my family members, <coughs> there may be some confusion in their mind between how they got into the Wyma family and how they maintain their status in the Wyma family. So, so one of my kids maybe has a strong sense of identity and they're very happy and joyful about being a Wyma and so they willfully and eagerly and thankfully do the Wyma things, right? But let's imagine I have another child in my family that's a little bit insecure and uh, they, they, this child worries a little bit about, you know, maybe messing up, you know, and, and not doing the Wyma things and, and then maybe jeopardizing their status. For such a person, it seems to me that the difference between getting in and staying in could be confused. And they, well, they forget that they got in by grace and maybe they think that they not only got in grace, but they, but they stay in, right? They, 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 they got in by by doing, in the analogy, the Wyma things. I have a quote which says it maybe in a clearer way. Uh, it goes like this. This comes from Don Hagner, who just retired not so long ago from Fuller Theological Seminary. He said, even if we allow that the emphasis on works has to do with staying in rather than getting in, as Sanders maintains, we may still be confronted with a decided preoccupation with works, a preoccupation which by its very nature makes for human insecurity and thus prepares a promising ground for the nurture of legalistic tendencies. Fifth uh, evaluation. Now Sanders argues that when we read the statements of Jews, either in the Talmud or in other sources, and when they sound legalistic, he says you should hear that in a covenant context. 
But despite what Sanders says, some of those statements still sound awfully legalistic. For example, look at this statement. A man should always regard himself as though he were half guilty and half meritorious. If he performs one precept, happy is he for weighing himself down in the scale of merit. If he commits one transgression, woe to him for weighing himself down in the scale of guilt. Remember, if you're an insecure member of, not the Wyma family, but maybe of the Jewish family, right? And you hear statements like this, you might, you might be really anxious about making sure that you have enough deeds, right, to balance the scale, not on the side of guilt, but on the, on the side of merit. We have a, 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 a comment from Klein Snodgrass, right, on this very thing. He says, there is an emphasis on weighing good deeds against bad in some writings, and on the keeping of ledger books in other Jewish writings, and this cannot be dismissed as easily as Sanders would like. A British scholar, Simon Gathercole, right, writes this on the same uh, point. We need to go back to E.P. Sanders and his insistence that Judaism in Paul's day did not think in terms of salvation as something earned or gained by obedience to the law. Now it is certainly the case that Protestant scholarship had previously exaggerated this fact, but it is not wrong either. Documents from around the time of Paul state that some Jews believed obedience to the law was rewarded on the final day with salvation. Quote, the one who does righteousness stores up life for himself with the Lord. That's from the Psalm of Solomon. And another quote, miracles, however, will appear at their own time to those who are saved by their works. Second Baruch. There are a number of examples like this. Paul's understanding of justification makes sense then as a criticism of the law, observance, as the means to eternal life. And so, again, there are legalistic sounding statements that cannot be so easily or quickly dismissed as Sanders would like us to believe. Yet a sixth evaluation, and that is a parallel between Christianity and Judaism. Now, Christianity is... I hope you would agree, a religion of grace. And yet, I can stand on the pulpit and I can preach sermon after sermon that we're not saved by works, right? It's a free and undeserved gift made possible through faith in Christ Jesus. I can preach and preach and preach that, but yet, how come when I go to some people's houses and I ask them either on their deathbed or I catch them in a personal moment, how come they still doubt their salvation? How come they still talk about all the bad things that they have done and how it's impossible for God to admit them and how they have to first prove themselves, right? As if they have to do something. In other words, despite Christianity being in theory and in well, reality too, I guess, a, a, a religion of grace, nevertheless we have people within our church fellowship who struggle with a legalistic or works righteousness way of thinking. Now if that's the way it is for Christianity, is it so hard to believe that that's the way it also would be for Judaism? Especially since Judaism emphasizes the law and works in such a strong way, it seems to me that <coughs> excuse me, that a legalistic tendency could easily emerge in not all, maybe not even in many, but at least in some circles within Judaism. And this would be true, of course, then for the first century, and this could also be true then for Jewish Christians and even Gentile Christians who were caught up with this legalistic way of thinking. I have a quote here from Carson and Moo on this uh, point. Any faith that emphasizes obedience, as Judaism undoubtedly did, is likely to produce some adherents, not all, right, maybe not even many, but at least some adherents, who perhaps through misunderstanding or lack of education turn their obedience into a meritorious service which they think God must reward. Christianity, with considerable less emphasis on law, certainly produces such adherents. Is it not likely that, as the New Testament suggests, first century Judaism did also? And my final point is this. I think that that legalism, works righteousness, is not necessarily a Jewish thing. I think it's a human thing. I think that our sinful human nature desperately wants to participate somehow in our salvation. I mean, cognitively, in abstract, we say, yes, salvation by grace is a good and wonderful thing. But in the heart of hearts, you know, if you take that seriously, that means that I contributed absolutely nothing. And I don't know about you, but 
for some of us, and I'm one of them, that's not always so easy to accept. I'd rather believe, even though I know it's wrong, I, I, it's more tempting for me to believe that I'm better than most people. Right? I'm a seminary professor. I've got all this knowledge. And, and what's more, I'm certainly better than my neighbor, you know, with this messed up marriage and kids who are all screwed up, right? I, I'd prefer to believe, you know, that when Wyma became a Christian, when I committed my life to Christ, there were kind of like high fives in heaven, right? Because, hey, everyone's happy that I'm on God's team. I mean, isn't that the way you prefer to think of yourselves? I know that's not true. I know that when I look at my life in the mirror of God's Word, I see that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? But, but what I'm trying to show is there, there is something kind of unique to us, right? That, that we want to participate at least a little bit in our own salvation. You see that already with little kids, right? Um, you try to help them with something, and uh, along the way they say, No, right? I want to do it myself. I think this is the point that Hagner is getting away with. It's just brief, brief comment. He says, a natural human tendency towards legalism. I found another quote from uh, Moises Silva, who taught at, uh, at uh, Westminster uh, in Philadelphia a good while, and then at uh, Gordon-Conwell. He talks about the human cry for personal autonomy that is endemic to the human condition and is not a unique Jewish problem. And so it's not that Judaism has a corner on this legalistic, works righteousness way of thinking. I think it's part of human nature. As we, even though we accept God's gracious gift, this free and undeserved gift, nevertheless we want to bring something to the table because somehow then we have more power or more control or somehow uh, we think more positively about ourselves. Now, when you put all of this together, how shall then we evaluate um, Sanders' paradigm-changing book? I think Sayon Kim is, is, uh, is helpful and reflects my own opinion on this matter. He says, The pendulum, which had swung too far toward the side of denying any element of works righteousness in Second Temple Judaism, right? that was after Sanders' work, has begun to swing back. When it eventually finds its equilibrium, we may see that neither the traditional view of Judaism as a religion of pure works righteousness, right, that's the old view that Sanders was rejecting, nor the new perspective that totally denies any element of works righteousness in Judaism is right, neither one is right, but that Judaism was, on the one hand, a covenantal gnomism, with, on the other hand, an element of works righteousness, right? So, so uh, Say and Kim says, you know, when things balance out, we may see that both are true. On the one hand, Judaism is not nearly as legalistic as we thought. It is indeed a works righteous. It is a grace-based religion, as Sanders asserts. But yet, it's not completely free of that problem, right? There is also an element of works righteousness within it too. And so that leads me to suggest to you that when we think of Judaism, there are at least two strands that we ought to think of. And I'm not even going to argue whether the one strand is big or small, but one strand I think that Sanders would say yes to, and another, of course, that he would deny. So I'm going to say yes to Sanders that, um, that there is one strand in Judaism that I'm going to call, differently than he calls, covenantal gnomism, I'm going to call reacting gnomism, reacting gnomism. This is a term from my doctoral supervisor, Richard Longenecker, and this is the idea that there are lots of Jews who what? Who react to God's grace, God's gracious activity in their life and their membership in the covenant, they react to that good news by nomos, by obeying the law. That's reacting nomism. In fact, it's no different than what we'll see as the third classic function or use of the law in Reformed thinking, namely as a guide for holy living, as an expression of gratitude for what God has done for us in Christ. Now, the other half, though, is important for me to assert. And again, Sanders is not going to like me for this. And I'm not even going to say whether this other strand is as big. It may even be a small wing within Judaism. But nevertheless, there is strong evidence to suggest that at least some Jews, right, thought about the law and obedience to the law in a kind of meritorious way, in a way that they could score points with God, that they could secure his favor. And remember, this is important because if Judaism has at least some element of works righteousness in it, then it's possible that Paul, 
writing to Jewish Christians, or maybe Gentile Christians who were under influence of such thinking, that Paul may indeed be also still criticizing, as the Reformational or Lutheran Orthodox view suggested, that Paul may be indeed criticizing um, a legalistic works righteous perspective. I end then with a quote from uh, Richard Longenecker, whom I referred to in just a moment. He says, The distinction between the contrast within Judaism often falls between what I will call an acting legalism and a reacting gnomism. By the way, notice the date. This is 1964, so Longenecker was ahead of his time. This was before the paradigm-changing work of Sanders came out. So already Longenecker is saying we ought to be a little more nuanced about our view of Judaism, right? There's two types. There's an acting legalism type, and there's a reacting gnomism type. And he says, the, between an ordering of one's life in external and formal arrangement according to the law in order to gain righteousness or to appear righteous, that's that acting legalism strand. And then the other one, right, the molding of one's life and all of its varying relations according to the law in response to the love and grace of God. And that's the reacting gnomism. That's the Sanders idea that Jews obeyed the law because they were so glad and thankful for God's gracious activity in their life and allowing them to be members of the covenant. Well, you're going to see that our next discussion then uh, is on the new perspective. So remember that Sanders' work has prepared the way for the new perspective, and now the new perspective needs to be evaluate, evaluated in light of maybe our critique of, uh, of Sanders' uh, paradigm-changing uh, work. But uh, that's for the next slide. We're going to catch our breath, and I'll see you again as we talk about the NPP, namely the New Perspective on Paul.